Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach for health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. Today we're going to be talking about hypothalamic amenorrhea and specifically uh, what we think is good and what we think is not so good from, I think, the most recent clinical practice guideline in 2017. So mm -hmm. a couple of years have passed since then, but there is not a ton of research being done in this area. Yeah, which is unfortunate. We have many patients with this condition, and it's actually a pretty common question that we get. So I guess with that, we should go see what the experts say, because evidence-based medicine is just going by expert recommendation, right? Well, to make this more exciting, let's talk about what we disagree with or some things that are in the guideline that, you know, could have been done a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, because this is, I don't think it's a, a society guideline, but it is a Actually, it is. It says an endocrine society clinical practice guideline. I was mistaken. So I know this is something that you have outlined extensively, the difference between a progestogen, progestin, progesterone, yep. what's bioidentical, what's not, sort of how that family yep. relates to each other. And they're citing this study. They say a randomized trial of th these female adolescents, yada, 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 were treated with some transdermal, 17 beta estradiol and cyclic progesterone therapy. Ooh, and then progesterone. If I was reading that, I would think, oh, they were treating them with bioidentical HRT. Um, but clearly that wouldn't be um, what the case is because in parentheses they show that this progesterone was actually medroxy progesterone which if I'm yeah. not mistaken is a progestin. So maybe we back up and actually outline for people, again, progestogens, progestin, and then progesterone. Yeah, and there, there's really no excuse for this. Um, Medroxyprogesterone does not need to be abbreviated <laughs> by progesterone, and it's somewhat misleading as well. Um, but yeah, uh, progestins or synthetic progestogens. Progestogens, um, think about, uh, you have your estrogens, for example, estradiol, estriol, you have your androgens, for example, testosterone, DHT, and you have your progestogens. And those are like progesterone, pregnenolone, DHP, and THP. THP is also known as pregnenolone. And then you have your synthetic progestins, of which medroxyprogesterone and medroxyprogesterone acetate is one of them. And that's what they were using in this study population. Yeah, so it's really no wonder that people are confused about hormones and that there needs to be education in this space because even... A very recent, like this isn't the, you know, 2001 Women's Health Initiative terms being thrown around anymore. This is 2017, so five, six years ago, where these terms are still being used interchangeably. And I see it all the time also with estrogens. So, you know, when you see a study and it's talking about estradiol increases the risk for, you know, blood clot or whatever the complication mm -hmm. is, well, you have to look at the delivery mechanism. Is it a you know, transdermal? Is it a gel? Is it a pill? Um, you know, what, how is it getting into the body? And then also when they say estradiol, are they talking about bioidentical estradiol or are they calling conjugated equine estrogen estradiol? Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit of a tricky scenario, but um, it, it's good to kind of back up and explain to people that, you know, just because you see something and you see, oh, well, you know, they were giving this progesterone or this estradiol, that may not be what the actual case is if you go look at the full text of the study. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, so then we get into you know, some of the treatment for, or potential treatment, I should mm -hmm. say, for hypothalamic amenorrhea. And I guess the, the, the short version of this is there's a increase in energy expenditure and or a decrease in energy intake. And mm -hmm. one of the things this disrupts is leptin signaling. So not to get too long-winded here, but you have lower levels of leptin. So, um, it's very intuitive to think if we just give this person leptin, you know, we know that hormone is low, we increase the levels yep. of that hormone, and recombinant leptin is an FDA approved medication, Yes. then we will restore that. And this has actually worked pretty well in studies. Uh, the position statement from this endocrine society guideline is, um, you know, this is just a statement relating to leptin. They recommend, you know, against it at this time, I believe. And they said, Unfortunately, the study reported subjective reductions in appetite and significant decreases in weight and fat mass in the treatment group, which has called into question the use of leptin in this patient group. By the way, hypothalamic amenorrhea is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it is amenorrhea, which is a lack of a menstrual period, and 
lack of ovulation due to um, the hypothalamus not signaling the pituitary to release gonadotropin. So hypothalamus is kind of upstream and then it sends a signal, um, usually GnRH in this case, um, to the pituitary and the pituitary signals to the gonads, again, ov the ovaries in this case, with LH and FSH. So low LH, low FSH, low estradiol, often low progesterone as well. And you have am amenorrhea, usually low BMIs, low body mass, and low fat mass. So the typical recommendation before this was, um, you know, eat more fat and eat more calories and stop exercising and uh, try to induce metabolic dysfunction. Well, that just sounds like move less and eat more. Yeah, so move less and eat more, <laughs> but there's obviously a lot more nuance to this. Um, getting more into this uh, recommendation against using leptin. So the reasons for against losing, using leptin was the significant decrease in body weight how significant was that? Yeah, it, the actual study they cited said body weight decreased slightly. So maybe they just, you know, misinterpreted or it's a, it's a typo, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But looking at actually what the body weight loss was, um, this primarily happened when they over doubled the dose of leptin during the third month of treatment in this mm. study. And it was still less than 5% of their body weight. And leptin is interesting, yeah, probably the reason it's approved for lipodystrophy is it seems to primarily drive body fat mass loss, mm -hmm. which isn't something that you would want to see happen to an extreme in a patient with hypothalamic amenorrhea because yep. it, you could look at it as this could potentially dig a person a deeper hole. So if you're treating someone with a, you know, a BMI of you know, 17, Leptin is probably not your first line there because that person needs to increase their body fat stores to sustain any kind of leptin production in the long run. But it was a very small, less than 5% of the body weight, which for most studies they're looking at, and you they cite a statistically significant change in body weight, usually that's above 5% of the body weight, sometimes more than 10%. Uh, if you're looking at you know things for like obesity treatment, usually yeah. that's, that's the benchmark there. Um, and then with regard to appetite, there were reductions in appetite. This makes sense with how leptin works and how leptin resistance develops and mm. causes hyperphagia or increased appetite. Subjects did report a reduction in appetite during the third month, but otherwise felt well. So the authors of the study felt good about the study and they're citing it as if the study, you would think that the conclusion was the opposite of the headline. I think the headline is something like, you know, leptin treatment in hypothalamic amenorrhea is effective. And you would think based on the way they cite it, that it was not an effective treatment and that it was potentially dangerous. Yeah, um, interesting conclusion. Um, one overarching theme I've noted with expert recommendations in general, but especially these expert recommendations, is often the recommendation is made looking at a single study or two studies in isolation, not accounting for other physiologic changes, which we will get into later. Um, but knowing the limitations of a study and discussing how it could potentially, how, uh, for example, how you could potentially attenuate the um, uh, higher dose of leptin needed later on in the study is important. Yeah, and I think this looks like, as you're looking at side effects in any study, a study is going to generally use a aggressive dosing or aggressive titrat titration regimen, whether mm -hmm. this is semaglutide for weight loss or uh, antidepressant for antidepressant therapy. So in practice, when you have a little bit longer of a time frame, you're not trying to prove to the FDA that your drug works, mm -hmm. you can individualize the treatment. You can start low and actually reduce the chance of those side effects. In a follow-up study of the Metroleptin actually did that. So in 2011, they sort of ran this study again and they individualized the dose to basically maintain patients' BMI. And their BMI changed from 21.1 to 20.8 over this whole study, which was, you know, I believe 36 weeks. Um, they did lose some fat, you know, about five pounds of fat. Uh, so the only way that they wouldn't lose BMI is if they actually increase lean body mass as well, which is kind of interesting. But basically, they individualized the dose instead of having a big jump in dose over doubling it at week um, 12 or month three, like they did in the 2004 study, they individualized the dose. And again, it was a successful treatment, quite well tolerated. Uh, I believe they actually had a patient drop out due to pregnancy in this study because, mm. you know, 
Fertility is another complication of hypothalamic amenorrhea, mm -hmm. which we'll kind of outline later on in the podcast for people that are interested in specifically what this is, why we should care, why we should treat it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, when it comes to anything that affects the uh, hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, you're thinking about each individual having dozens of inputs. So look at any chart that looks at inputs and a single output, for example, the GNRH output of the hypothalamus or the GHRH output of a hypothalamus. If we were looking at a medication like Lupron or Triptorelin a long time ago, and you saw a, you know, uh, a high dose being uh, effective right off the bat, but then a tachyphylaxis, even a years long tachyphylaxis, that's what it's used for um, being effective, then you would make the conclusion, no, um, that GNRH is bad for correct. downstream gonadotropin production, correct. obviously. Yeah. So <laughs> um, you can make the conclusion, no GNRH ag like analog or agonist is a good idea at all to improve gonadotropin release, which is LH and FSH. Obviously, that's not the case. Yeah. And it's kind of like this recurring theme of like, you don't want to be like too cold or too hot in any one area. You're typically going to have like, you know, a subpar outcome or some sort of pathology that develops, whether it's a resistance or whether the like mm -hmm. signaling of something downstream is actually dependent on having some of that hormone at play. Speaking of that, we should probably talk about estradiol at some point. Yeah, we can touch on a brief, actually related to hypothalamic amenorrhea, um, estriol which is not estradiol, but it is an estrogen to help people keep these things kind of clear. It's a weak estrogen, so taking it orally um, doesn't have much of an effect. Um, in theory, it can relieve some menopausal symptoms. It's usually used in you know, a topical form, um, but it's not going to give the same protection for like bone density yeah. and things of that nature. So it's a very benign, very mild estrogen. And they gave oral estriol to some of these patients with hypothalamic amenorrhea, and they saw that their pulsatility of luteinizing hormone improved. And the reason for this is that your pituitary, or I'll just say your HPG axis for simplicity, so everything that signals between hypothalamus, pituitary, and your ovaries, is dependent on having some estrogen in the system for the sensitivity to the GnRH, which we just referenced. So you have a hormone that will stimulate LH, and then that downstream will stimulate estrogen, but you have to have some estrogen in the system for that to function appropriately. Uh, so we call this a permissive effect. Yeah, so it, it's something that has to be looked at. If you have a patient that has an estradiol of less than five or undetectable, mm -hmm. like they would be a better candidate for some estrogen signaling increase, whether using you know, perhaps transdermal estradiol or oral estriol like this study did to kind of get the system running again because you have to have that estradiol there for the sensitivity to work. There's so many moving parts in this. It's a pretty complex condition. The analogy we make for this is the spark plug effect. So you can pump as much fuel into the system as you like and you can turn your key, but if the spark plug is not firing, then you're not gonna have the downstream effects. And We'll get to this later, but this does appear to be a two key effect where both keys have to turn at the same time. So we'll get into that later. Yeah, and we do really like analogies. Our, some of our audience probably loves them. Some of the audience probably hates them. So let us know what you think of our analogies, but we always seem to come back to cars because it's just, it, it's kind of natural, it seems like, and it, yeah. it makes sense to us. Yeah. Um, I guess not all hormones, you don't wanna just replace every hormone. Like obviously if you use a uh, progestin like you know, uh, something that's in an oral contraceptive or a progestin-only mm -hmm. pill, that's going to kind of be counterintuitive to everything you're doing. You're basically going to block ovulation, block pituitary signaling. Mm -hmm. um, testosterone, this was a recommendation that I would actually agree with in general. Yep. Um, they're talking about specifically bone density. They say they suggest against bisphosphonates, biologics, testosterone, and leptin to improve bone mineral density in hypothalamic amenorrhea. Then they have their section that says evidence. And then they go through why bisphosphonates are not a good choice, why biologics are not a good choice. Um, but then there's zero mention of why they recommended against testosterone. The reason they likely recommended against testosterone is because that will decrease leptin signaling 
And even though they didn't mention it in this paper, I did find some other, I guess, expert overviews. And they sort of tied the recommendation of not using androgens, not necessarily testosterone, but androgens for bone mineral density in hypothalamic amenorrhea. Because when you add, you know, DHEA and like a oral contraceptive, you know, synthetic estrogen, it doesn't improve the bone mineral density because you're, you're sort of shooting yourself on the foot there in relation to your downstream IGF-1 signaling. So it's kind of an extrapolation from an extrapolation and they don't give a clear overview of the evidence, which is really what you'd like to see in an expert guideline. Yeah, uh, not even to mention that it's kind of laughable that they would use DHEA as their example of an androgen given that DHEA and testosterone really shouldn't be compared when it comes to level of androgen receptor activation, um, for example, in the bone or the muscle. So it's interesting. I do not disagree with the recommendation for uh, bone mineral density. However, it is individualized. So if there's an individual with very low testosterone that does not desire fertility um, for whatever reason, and it's, um, they are unlikely to desire fertility in the future, then it could make a lot more sense as part of the rest of a regimen, but it's certainly not addressing the root cause. Yeah, you know, the best case scenario is you are able to kind of hit the reset button, jumpstart the system, get natural hormone production up and going, particularly mm -hmm. the younger the patient is. Yep. You wouldn't want to just take a 20 year old and put them on a regimen that you would put a you know, 55 year old menopausal woman on. Mm -hmm. It's not very individualized. But it does depend on the patient's, you know, unique goals and their unique situation. Yeah. So I guess before we jump into sort of all of their treatment recommendations, it would make a bit of sense to go back and talk about sort of, you know, what is hypothalamic amenorrhea? Um, you know, what are those complications? Sort of a little bit of the physiology behind it. Uh, and then it might be easier for people to understand why these specific treatment recommendations are made. So mm -hmm. it's a very heterogeneous, very variable condition. Um, there's not a clear picture of like the timeline. You know, some people will have this condition for, you know, a decade. It, it kind of depends on if and when they seek medical care and the quality of the care and the interventions. And some people will just, you know, naturally recover after a stressful event. You know, this will kind of disrupt HPG function. And then three, six months later, they may be up and running again. They just sort of hit a speed bump and they move past it. But Basically, you have a lot of athletes that will develop something like this. There's yeah. something called the athlete's triad. Um, there is some interplay with exercise in general. The beta endorphins can have a little bit of a suppressive effect on the pituitary. Mm -hmm. This is an area where we kind of you know, see a similar phenomenon in, in men, not to get too far off of the, the subject at hand, um, but it's an observation that's there. This exercise, especially overtraining, and the beta endorphins, its effect on the pituitary, and then undernourishment, um, and then stress. And whether that stressor is just exercise, whether it's a psychological stressor, it plays a role. And I guess you could argue that, you know, is there any condition where raising stress would be helpful or improve that condition? I guess it depends on what you'd mean by stress. So raising cortisol, certainly so. But raising levels of uh, stress is an interesting thing to talk about. It's obviously a pillar of health as well, but you want to be able to make the effort feel good in whatever life stressors send your way, whether it is the stress of raising a young child or the stress of having a unknown job situation or the stress of needing to resistance train. So a poor response to stress would be to worry about it and then your sleep will go off because of it, your diet will go off, so all the other lifestyle pillars will fall, will fall down. And in that case, um, there is certainly no condition where you want to be like overly stressed to a point where you cannot handle it. Yeah, and I think it goes to like, you know, perceived stress and negative stressors rather than a, you know, a positive stressor, like, you know, challenging yourself to reach a goal mm -hmm. is, you know, largely gonna be a positive stressor in most cases. Yep. Um, but I guess to back up, you know, why would someone even think that they might have hypothalamic amenorrhea? So this is when a woman stops having her regular menstrual cycle. Yep. And it wouldn't be because you're on a like progestin only birth control. If, if you're on that and you develop amenorrhea, that can happen to yep. a lot of women that's considered within the normal range. 
it's sort of the opposite of the PCOS spectrum. PCOS is also a very heterogeneous mm-hmm. um, condition um, that kind of changes. We've done podcasts on PCOS in the past, but it's somewhat the opposite in that you usually have um, metabolic dysfunction because of poor nutrient status. Instead of overnutrition, it's undernutrition. Instead of um, usually less exercise, it is too much exercise. Um, often your uh, leptin levels are lower. Often you have lower LH, lower FSH, lower estradiol, and occasionally low androgen status as well. So in general, poor output from the ovaries rather than too much output from the ovaries. Yeah, and this gets into kind of what your workup looks like. So, you know, they make recommendations about getting a good history and physical exam and a a laboratory workup Mm -hmm. because you don't just want to assume that this person has a leptin deficiency when they actually have a prolactinoma that's Mm -hmm. blocking their menstruation, their their hormone production. Perhaps they had a surgery and they had to take out uh, half of their ovaries or an ovary and a half. And that can also mimic hypothalamic amenorrhea. But just like you can have primary and secondary hypogonadism in men, which primary would be the gonadal dysfunction, secondary would be hypothalamic and pituitary function, HA um, is hypothalamic dysfunction, of course. Yeah, so you could kind of, you look at your gonadotropins and you can look at, okay, is this more of a HA phenotype or is this more like premature ovarian insufficiency? That's a pretty clear delineation. Yep. You also want to look at things like, you know, thyroid. It wouldn't be uncommon for someone to have a, a pretty profound hypothyroid state, mm-hmm. lose their menstrual cycle, and then you don't add leptin to that. You would look at, you know, okay, let's, you know, figure out what's going on with the thyroid. Do they have antibodies? Do they need thyroid hormone replacement? Fix that root cause. And then, you know, you're going to fix the menstrual cycle downstream of that. Mm-hmm. So you look at all these things in the blood work. Um, Depending on the length of time, they also had a recommendation in there for, you know, getting a DEXA scan for bone density, Mm -hmm. which I thought was a very good recommendation because the patients that I see in practice, and I'm sure this is the same in your cases, they may have had several years of missing menses, you know, presumably being in a low estrogen state and they have not had a DEXA scan. And, you know, that's something we have a very low threshold to go ahead and get and see, Mm -hmm. you know, where is this person in relation to bone density? Because that can Mm -hmm. steer basically, you know, trajectory going forward and, and how much emphasis you want to put on bone building. Yeah, especially if the patient had this condition develop at 16 and now they're 21, that is a very different situation because um, bone density, even in the early 20s, can be affected. We know this from growth hormone studies and IGF-1 studies. A 20-year-old versus a 40-year-old, um, IGF-1 and GH exogenous replacement or endogenous stimulation is not going to greatly improve bone mass at an age of 40, but at the age of 20, it certainly could. And like the same is likely true of correcting the hypothalamic amenorrhea. Yeah, yeah definitely increasing the estrogen. So basically everything that your body produces to try and hold on to bone, you want to like line up all those variables when you can still affect that peak bone density, mm-hmm. which is not at age 40, but at age 20, you still have a lot of bone that can be added at that point. Mm-hmm. So I guess we can go through the recommendations here. Um, this is basically just, you know, treatment. So, you know, when you put someone in patient, so this would be probably overlapping with an eating disorder. If you're seeing these sorts of things like a severe energy deficit, uh, and this is where the you know psychology comes into it. So they recommend that clinicians evaluate patients for inpatient treatment who have FHA and severe bradycardia, hypotension, orthostasis, or electrolyte imbalances. So these things typically would develop in the context of an eating disorder, severe malnutrition, severe mm-hmm. overtraining. Um, so I think that's a reasonable recommendation. You don't want to yep. try and manage someone like that outpatient. You're not going to have a great outcome. Yeah. Um, when you have these signs, uh, that regardless of the condition, then you're considering <laughs> inpatient admission. Yeah. So that's a good one. The next one is in adolescents and women with FHA, we recommend correcting the energy imbalance to improve HPO access function. Um, this often requires behavioral change. So that's, you know, we agree with behavioral changes often. Lifestyle interventions are the most powerful interventions. Medications and supplements are just tools. And that starts with diet and lifestyle. So they they talk about either increasing caloric consumption, improved nutrition, which is um, 
can be separate from caloric consumption, of course. You can have nutrient-dense foods and calorically-dense foods. And then also uh, decreasing exercise. Perhaps they could also say decreasing caloric expenditure during exercise. Yeah, and I think with relating to like nutrition, um, Peter Atia does a nice job. He talks about people being overnourished and undermuscled. So they're getting too many calories, but not enough nutrients, and they don't have the exercise in place. Yep. In this case, yeah, it does sound very much like, you know, just move less and eat more. Not everybody can afford a dietitian consult to mm -hmm. figure out what that looks like for them. So I guess if you have, you know, 15 minutes to kind of give a patient a pitch on, hey, this is likely going to be the best diet to improve your, you know, um, energy intake, improve your leptin signaling, what does yep. that look like? Yeah, and that's a very difficult question and not even all uh, physicians and dietitians are will be adept at handling that because hypothalamic amenorrhea, specifically naturally optimizing endogenous leptin signaling often requires a decrease in protein relative to fat and carbohydrate consumption, which is the opposite of probably what 98% of what the population needs. Yeah. Yeah. And especially this, the messaging in the health and wellness space. If someone like, let's say I'm a patient, I have mm -hmm. hypothalamic amenorrhea. I'm listening to a bunch of people talking about, you know, resetting your hormones and they're talking about, you know, exercise and eating high protein Yes, and maybe they talk about eating low carbohydrates or mm -hmm. carb cycling or keto mm -hmm. and all these sorts of things. But specifically for hypothalamic amenorrhea, you want to optimize, um, interestingly, probably not canola oil. Mm -hmm. That seems to have a specifically yep. leptin decreasing effect. I don't know if there's a term for that. Um, but in women, um, rapeseed oil or canola seed oil will decrease your leptin, which is the opposite of what you want. But things like saturated fats, monounsaturated fats are still pretty good choices. Mm -hmm. Um, carbohydrates, especially, you know, fructose has been specifically studied. There's not a ton of nutritional research in this area, but basically prioritizing, you know, carbohydrates and fats still with modest protein intake. You don't mm -hmm. want to have a zero protein diet, of course, but yep. enough to, you know, let's say 50 grams of protein for someone who's, you know, 50 kilograms. They're not going to be in a, in a cachectic state because of that, especially because they're increasing you know, energy intake, which is mm -hmm. going to help with lean body mass to some extent. So a summary would be moderate carbohydrate, moderate fat with low canola oil, and moderate protein. Sounds like a pretty balanced approach, but... Everything in moderation. Yeah. it. it I think a, a good clinical pearl here is that it would be easy to just recommend low carb, high fat, high protein, and that is not the best diet for most people with HA. Um, going to the next recommendation, um, it's interesting because you're thinking about hypothalamic amenorrhea, certainly a condition with a lot of um, physiologic cause. And this recommendation is suggesting psychological support like CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. And it's interesting that this is pegged so high in their recommendations. So, you know, they're talking about, okay, this is when you send somebody to the hospital, eat more or yeah, eat more, move less. And then number three is psychological support. So I don't know that that's necessarily the order you would go about this in a patient visit, like your average mm -hmm. clinician out there. And the handling of this needs to be certainly very individualized and in, in, in a delicate situation because yep. You're not just going to say, yeah, well, you need to, you know, develop a better relationship with food and your body and your stress. You know, this is not a physical condition. This is just psychological. I think that could That's, be very damaging. Yeah. That um, could nuke your physician patient rapport. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. But I also don't want to understate the importance of managing stress because we've talked about it before. Cardiovascular disease, the inner heart trial, mm -hmm. chronic work stress independent of anything else is going to double somebody's odds, you know, their relative risk of mm -hmm. having a cardiovascular event. So, you know, stress does have very real effects on physiologic conditions and explaining to them that, no, this is not just all in your head, mm -hmm. but yes, managing stress can be an important part of this yep. comprehensive treatment plan. 
Yeah, think so. think about explaining this to a male with hypothalamic hypogonadism. Uh, for example, Nick Bear, we know, just did a bodybuilding show. He had a total testosterone of right around 100. He's very stressed. He has a family. He's been in a caloric deficit. He has low LH, and I'm sure he has low GNRH input as well. And in a case like, so that is kind of the male corollary of hypothalamic hypo. Uh, uh, amenorrhea is hypothalamic hypogonadism and um telling a guy like yeah. that that he needs to reevaluate his relationship with food and yep. manages stress better it's not just therapy and food maybe don't lead with that yeah <laughs> yeah i guess what we're getting at is that there's a a very solid uh or a primarily physiologic cause of hypothalamic amenorrhea so overemphasizing the need for doing behavioral therapy is not one of the go-tos, but an important thing to individualize for a patient. Yeah, absolutely. All right, welcome back to part two of the Gillette Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. And by part two, we mean part two of hypothalamic amenorrhea. So you may notice we are wearing slightly different clothing. Um, we had some technical difficulties, so we're going to kind of pick up where we left off and talk about some recommendations that this expert guideline, the Endocrine Society has put forth specifically for, um, you know, this could just be for the primary care provider, maybe somebody who's in a rural area to uh, manage a patient that presents with suspected or known hypothalamic amenorrhea. So anyway, uh, next recommendation is we suggest against patients with FHA using oral contraceptive pills for the sole purpose of regaining menses or improving bone mineral density. So just because the patient has a menstrual cycle doesn't mean you've solved the problem? Correct. Um, so obviously in this case, if the patient is seeking out medical services to improve current or future fertility, they likely would not want this intervention. Um, yeah, I think that's all we need to say about that recommendation. Yeah, and there are some studies out there where it looks like women who are placed on oral contraceptive actually have a decreased likelihood of the return of spontaneous menses. And perhaps because then, you know, things appear to be functioning as they should, and they may have the uh, perception that, okay, I'm, you know, I'm healthy again, I'm protecting my bones, my hormones are balanced. Mm -hmm. And I guess they are to some degree, but it's not, um, not a full, not a true recovery is, yeah. is what I'm trying to say. So, so how is this unique to hypothalamic amenorrhea? Maybe every patient starting an oral contraceptive should be counseled regarding that risk. So they shouldn't be taking them for the sole purpose of managing acne? What if they just don't want a menstrual period? <laughs> uh, th this is just another good, and we have an episode just on oral contraceptives. This is another good microcosm of the need for uh, like true shared decision-making being done with a patient. So they're actually aware, oral contraceptives, as um, we've said, is just synthetic hormone replacement therapy. They're synthetic hormones and um, they are more complicated than HRT. So if your doctor is not extremely comfortable managing HRT, then perhaps you don't want them managing your synthetic HRT. And as we've said before, yes, uh, being able to choose when or when not to conceive is perhaps the biggest benefit that there is in medicine because it's gonna benefit you, like all the different pillars of life and your entire family and such. Um, but again, the nuance in that is choosing when to or when not to. So oral contraceptives are certainly help, uh, certainly good at decreasing the chance that you conceive while you're on them, but not necessarily good at helping you conceive after you get off. That's very true. And another thing you said there, I think is really a gem for our listeners because we get questions about, you know, how do I find a good doctor? And if you put out the feeler question, how do you feel about hormone replacement after menopause? And let's say that doctor, PA, nurse practitioner says, oh, I don't do anything with that. It's too complicated. But then they're putting a large percent of their population on oral contraceptives. Then they probably don't have a good grasp on hormones overall. Because mm -hmm. as you've mentioned in the past, and I agree, HRT in postmenopause is actually less tricky because there are many fewer options. It's just a higher risk patient population. So we, yeah, we can even take screener. this. A, yeah. yeah, we can take this a step further. How do you feel about bioidentical hormones? For example, a very low dose of testosterone in a female that is deficient while they're on an oral contraceptive before menopause using bioidenticals 
And conversely, how do you feel about using a scary synthetic hormone in specific scenarios after menopause? So maybe that's the second follow-up question. If they get the first one right, they say, yeah. oh yeah, hormone replacement for women with menop after menopause makes sense. Then mm -hmm. you follow up with what about testosterone premenopausally while someone's on an oral contraceptive or what about synthetics after menopause? Yeah. Uh, if you really want to, I guess, see how elite your hormone expert is. What percent of providers would you say would pass all three questions in that test? I, it's got to be single it's digits. It's got to be low. Yeah, probably yeah. one percent or two percent. Yeah. But anyway, uh, it gets a bit of a rabbit trail there, but uh, I, this is another interesting point about oral contraceptive pills. The recommendation three point five. <laughs> In patients with FHA using oral contraceptives for contraception, we suggest educating patients regarding the fact that OCPs may mask the return of spontaneous menses, kind of just talked about that, yep. and that bone loss may continue, particularly if patients maintain an energy deficit. But since these women, they may be getting 20 or 30 micrograms of synthetic ethanol estradiol, mm -hmm. doesn't that mean that any woman who is suppressing hormone production on an oral contraceptive might also be at risk for bone loss? That That is a good assumption to make. Um, I like the phrasing, uh, this is verbatim, the fact that OCPs may mask the return of spontaneous menses. So we'll just uh, meditate on that as we consider shared decision-making protocol for OCPs once again. Uh, next recommendation, uh, 3.6. There we are. We suggest the short-term use of transdermal E2 estradiol therapy in, with a cyclic oral progestin, not oral contraceptives or ethanol estradiol, in adolescents or women who have not had a return of menses after a reasonable trial of nutritional, psychological, and or modified exercise intervention. Um, this is... This is relatively reasonable, especially if a patient desires fertility sooner rather than later. I do find it interesting that um, they mentioned that they need a trial of uh, nutritional, psychological, and modified exercise interventions. Th does this mean they have to see a dietitian, do CBT, and see a physical therapist or trainer before they get the estradiol? If you are going by the guidelines, then yes. I, I suppose if you don't have a, a robodoc, then there would be some level of like, okay, how hard did you try? You know, it's like, okay, did you eat more food and, and not exercise as much for one week? Well, that's yeah. a trial, but you know, the question is what is the, what's a reasonable duration there? And also where is this woman in the timeline of her fertility? So is it a 20 year old who has presumably quite a window of fertility ahead, or is this a woman who is 37 years old where fertility is her primary concern? Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of you know nuance that's layered in and not explicitly stated there. Yeah, it is interesting that they include adolescence in that recommendation. So um, I, the reason why I think that's interesting is because adolescents presumably have more time to address the root cause and use a multifactorial approach. And adolescents are also mo more likely to have HA um, from near the onset of menarche. Menarche is the first menses. So presumably these are um, women that have had menarche, had their first menses. Has to be. <laughs> and then very soon developed um, uh, amenorrhea or lack of menses after that. So a situation where, like let's say there's an individual who's only had six menstrual periods her entire life that is um, kind of similar, to, uh, like um, it, that case would be similar to a case of a male with delayed puberty. Because it's not like uh, menarche or the first menses is all or nothing. That individuals had um, likely very low estrogen signaling throughout and would be higher risk if things are not corrected. Yeah, so I guess this makes the sense like much, much further down the line. And maybe I'm reading into this too much and sort of straw manning their position, but it appears to me that they would say, yep, if diet, exercise, and therapy don't work, you're going on transdermal estradiol before there's any talk of any sort of you know intervention with like cyclical progesterone mm -hmm. or naltrexone or yep. leptin therapy or yep. these other things that have study data that shows a return of spontaneous menses and mm -hmm. you know, 
resolution of hypothalamic amenorrhea, there's no mention of that. It's sort of straight to HRT um, mm -hmm. and with, you know, a reasonable choice, transdermal estradiol, yeah. looking at long-term bone density, not stated there, but I'm assuming that's the biggest thing they're looking at. Because if you have a 20-year-old, you don't want them to go 30 years with essentially zero estrogen in their system. Yeah, and you also don't want them to be on an oral estrogen. So that's the right takeaway from this recommendation. We can move to the next one. Uh, next one is, we suggest against using bisphosphonates, denosumab, testosterone, and leptin to improve bone mineral density. So I guess that's kind of a, an interesting qualifier. Um, I mean, it makes sense not to use bisphosphonate for bone mineral density. Um, the others, I would say, in, uh, for example, uh, testosterone or leptin. Testosterone, you probably don't want. Yeah. Suppressing your hypothalamus further. And this was interesting because after each of these points, they sort of give their <laughs> evidence for why they arrived at this conclusion. And there was no mention of testosterone whatsoever in the rationale. It was just like, don't do it. Um, but we know that there are reasons to not use testosterone, yeah. you know, specifically because you're likely going to push down leptin, which you need to get the pituitary up and running. Now, I don't think that giving leptin is going to help bone mineral density. Mm -hmm. Giving leptin actually has a pretty high likelihood of, in the right candidate, of course, mm -hmm. resol uh, resolving the hypothalamic amenorrhea. Yeah. Uh, next recommendation is in rare cases, we suggest a short-term use of recombinant parathyroid hormone. Uh, I believe the other name for that's uh, rec reclast, um, but as an option in setting of delayed fracture healing. Um, so I suppose this makes sense. It's kind of odd that it's so still so high up in the recommendation list. It's a very niche scenario. Yeah. It looks like they're kind of zeroed in on, you know, the only complication of this disorder would be bone loss and risk of fractures. And what do we do when people lose bone and what do we do when people have fractures? Yeah. Next is in patients wishing to conceive after a complete fertility workup. Excellent. We suggest treatment with a pulsatile gonadotropin releasing hormone as a first line, followed by gonadotropin therapy and induction of ovulation when GNRH is not available. Um, it's kind of interesting. The next part of it says cautious use of gonadotropin therapy. It's a good qualifier. Um, could mean a lot of things, but I certainly agree with cautious use of, I guess, everything. But And as an aside there, what is a complete fertility workup? Maybe that maybe that's a rabbit hole to did go down. Did they define that? I don't think they defined that. I don't think so. They did a, a pretty good workup for hypothalamic amenorrhea. They actually had two sets, like your initial screening and then like a, mm -hmm. a follow-up panel of sorts. But I don't think that it's defined specifically what is a comprehensive mm -hmm. fertility workup. I know they at least mentioned anti-malarian hormone or AMH and making sure that you're not in premature ovarian insufficiency, previously called uh, early menopause. So that's good of note if you're on an oral contraceptive that can alter uh, AMH as well. Um, going on down the rest of this recommendation, a trial of treatment with clomiphene citrate, so clomid, uh, okay. uh, for ovulation induction if a woman has sufficient endogenous estrogen level. So um, the chance that someone has sufficient endogenous estrogen level seems pretty low. And then is it really Hypothalamic, like that, yeah. Close to hypothalamic amenorrhea. So is this like the transition zone where someone had hypothalamic amenorrhea and then they get their menses back and maybe their serum estradiol is not averaging 100 or 150, but maybe they're at a serum E2 of 60. Mm -hmm. And we think, okay, this is something that can sustain a pregnancy. Their body's going to respond well. We just need to get them ovulating. So I, I don't know. That's really reading into this a lot yeah. and it seems to kind of contradict itself because one of the defining characteristics of FHA is a very low or even undetectable serum estradiol level. Yeah. Um, so that's an interesting recommendation, especially in the setting of the next one. They recommend against the use of kispeptin and leptin for treating fertility. So if you're amenorrheic, things that can restore menstrual periods, they recommend against. Yeah, and I think they're breaking this up as sort of a compartment, right? You either are working on fertility or you're working on returning menses. They're not thinking like a step ahead almost. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, okay, you resolve the amenorrhea, 
menses return, your ovulating fertility ties in directly after yeah. that, but it just doesn't seem like it was evaluated that way. This is what functional medicine was supposed to be, is addressing the root cause. It's not what functional medicine developed into, unfortunately, but thinking about the root cause, and I believe we discussed this at length in part one of this episode, is you're not only thinking about the hypothalamus's output of GnRH, you're thinking about the kisspeptin related neurons and how they're stimulated in the hippocampus and the limbic system. You're thinking about inputs of AMSH, you're thinking about inputs of leptin, um, and you're thinking about caloric balance and also nutritive properties of your caloric intake. So there's a difference between nutrient dense foods and calorically dense foods. Um, so yeah, these recommendations, like you said, they are um, more like treating a symptom. How do we read the clinical literature that we have so far in order to treat the symptoms and um, with, uh, I guess, not too much um, thought put towards the root cause of the situation? Yeah, it, it's really compartmentalized in answering a question about a single aspect of the disease as opposed to looking at it as a like longitudinal process. You know, the yep. analogy I think you and I are, you have potentially talked about is the blind man and the elephant. Well, it's like hypothalamic amenorrhea is like a fertility problem. Yeah. And the other recommendation says, no, hypothalamic amenorrhea is like a bone problem. And then you have someone else yes. that says, no, hypothalamic amenorrhea is a, a menstrual problem. Yeah. And they're all looking at these different compartments of like what is hypothalamic amenorrhea instead of stepping back and looking at all of the physiology. So who do you see? Do you see your endocrinologist for um, the osteoporosis? Do you see your REI, your reproductive uh, infertility specialist, or maybe even your OB-GYN for the anovulatory problem? Um, there's no, there's seldom an interdisciplinary team thinking about all the different systems working together at the same time. And that's another reason why it reminds me of PCOS, another an often anovulatory condition. Mm -hmm. It's confusing to have specific recommendations because they're heterogeneous diseases and they, ha they can have multiple different root causes and all cases are different. So you can't just plug it into the idiocracy auto doctor and then <laughs> have it spit out what every patient should do. And your bill is this many dollars. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 3.10 says, we suggest that clinicians should only induce ovulation in women with FHA that have a body mass index of at least 18.5 kilograms. And only after attempts to normalize energy balance due to increased risk for fetal loss, SGA babies, preterm labor, C-section delivery for extreme low birth weight. Um, and this is something that I think is reasonable. You know, when you're looking at, you know, what is the ideal BMI to start a pregnancy at? What is the ideal BMI specifically for someone with FHA? Mm -hmm. Now, probably the higher in the normal range that is, the more favorable that's going to be because they're going to have more of that adipose tissue for more hormone signaling, whether that's, you know, leptin, um, estradiol production that's going to make your GnRH actually work at the pituitary. Mm -hmm. There's all these things to take into account. So you certainly don't want someone that is severely malnourished to get, you know, treat the fertility issue just for the sake of, okay, problem solved. Now you're pregnant yeah. because you may be causing some iatrogenic harm there. Yeah. Um, this recommendation is also not unique to hypothalamic amenorrhea. So <laughs> it's a good recommendation. Um, I believe we, did we talk about trials in the previous yeah, I, well. I think we did touch on the trials. Um, we do need to follow up and talk a little bit about you know, kind of what I was alluding to with the sensitization of the pituitary by estradiol and then sort of how GnRH and how kisspeptin, although kisspeptin seems underwhelming when used as a sort of single intervention, mm -hmm. why we may not see the results we would expect there and what sort of, you know, I think combination therapies might make sense to explore in trials or explore uh, in patients who have this problem and, and goals. Yeah, um, and apologies if we somewhat address this in part one, but when you look at leptin, kispeptin, and also AMSH, there is a pretty good amount of, there's there's plenty of trials on leptin. We, we discussed the one with 20 patients from 2011. That was a follow-up to the 2004 study. And um, there's pretty good evidence that that works in and of itself and the way that we think of leptin is Leptin helps induce GnRH when other conditions are met. So um, the conditions would be active kispeptin, 
and likely active AMSH. The AMSH is from preclinical data. Um, KISS peptin looks for sure, but the way I think of it is a two key system. So you turn two keys at the same time to start your car. So if those keys happen to be turned and you give leptin, then leptin fires the alternator or whatever, I'm not a car person. <laughs> leptin starts the car and induces pulsatile GNRH production. But if only one of the keys or zero of the keys is turned, then it does not work. So it makes a lot of sense to induce with a very short course, a week or two. This isn't really known yet, but um, if nobody gets to doing trials on this, eventually we will in our lifetime. Um, but uh, if you need to turn the KISS peptin key or even the AMSH key, very short period of time to turn the keys and then use leptin to start the car. Yeah, and I guess the analogy there would be the computer system being like the presence of estradiol. I guess that's a pretty good analogy because yeah. you know estradiol is associated with brain health and brain function to quite a strong degree. Um, and if your computer, you know, your car doesn't have the computer, it doesn't have the brains, you can crank the key, you can have fuel, you can have a spark, but if you don't have a computer regulating that, it's just not going to work. And that's what the, you know, estradiol is needed for is to make sure that when your KISS peptin triggers that GNRH, that that GNRH is actually gonna get things fired up and get things like luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone actually being produced. We know this is also true. So in both males and females, often the uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis has estradiol is what's called a permissive effect. So the permissive effect, and this is, might be true of estriol as well. So that's one of the reasons why we're very interested in estriol, given that estriol is not gonna bind the estradiol alpha receptor near as strong in growth plates, so it's not gonna close growth plates for other conditions, but it's also um, just a weaker estrogen in general and may still have that permissive effect for kickstarting the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Yeah, and in a much better, I would say a much lower risk potential than something like even a transdermal estradiol, or certainly more so than oral estradiol. Yep. Uh, in this patient population, if you can sort of prime the system or reboot the computer with estriol, like that's part of this sort of combination therapy mm -hmm. where it's like, hey, maybe we need all of these things working together in harmony instead of looking at estriol by itself. Oh, that doesn't cure amenorrhea. Yep. You know, oh, kiss peptin by itself, that doesn't cure amenorrhea. Guess yep. there's no cure. Well, can actually combine some of these things, just like with, um, I guess this is being done a lot now in antidepressant and both also diabetic treatment, mm -hmm. where it seems like there's a new label for an adjunctive treatment for basically any antidepressant or any antipsychotic out there. It's like, well, you just combine these things and then we don't know how it works, but now the patient's not depressed. Um, it, if yeah. only women's health issues got the same attention. Yeah, I wish that they would. Um, perhaps one analogy that we could make is estrogens, uh, the permissive effect of them is like putting your key in the ignition. So you can turn your key all you want in the air, but you actually have to put it in the ignition to give it a chance. Another estrogen that could be in reasonable if estriol does not work is estetrol, which is E4. Uh, I believe it comes from the fetal liver. We've discussed it before. So there's a lot of estrogens other than estradiol that can potentially have this permissive effect. Yeah. Anything else we need as far as the you know, takeaway point? Uh, let's see if we miss anything from the notes there. Um, I don't believe so. No, um, I think this is a pretty good summary. So um, hopefully people found this useful. It's sort of a niche topic, but there are people out there. I know there's been questions and comments on previous podcasts. Mm -hmm. We thought it good to devote a whole episode to this because you, know, mm -hmm. you would think based on if we just ran the percentages in our clinic that the incidence of this condition is much higher than it is, is in actuality. Um, but that's just because we have this sort of, you know, I guess a, a bias in our population where yep. these people will seek us out specifically because there is some sort of hormonal problem there. Yeah. One good takeaway that uh, could be attributed to this condition is this condition, it is especially important to have an individualized approach and to be thinking about root cause and pathophysiology of the condition in each individual as it's different. But really every condition, even just routine menopause can be uh, very different from woman to woman. For example, some are gonna have very minimal vasomotor symptoms of menopause and genitourinary symptoms. Some are gonna have um, like relatively high serum estradiols and DHEA sulfates and good adrenal production. Some of them are gonna have uh, persistent testosterone production from theca cells. 
and some are not going to. So really these concepts can be applied to any condition, but it's just particularly important in hypothalamic amenorrhea. And traditional menopause, as you mentioned there, uh, is certainly an oxymoron if there ever was one. <laughs> yeah, certainly so. Well, I think that sums it up. As always, we thank you for your time and may God give you health and happiness. Thank you.